Chapter 17, An Introduction to Special Senses. Now this is also going to be a light overview of the special senses, just kind of give us a little introduction to it for now. Um, there are five special senses. We have olfaction, which is smelling, sense of smell, um, gustation, which is tasting, vision, I think that speaks for itself, equilibrium, and hearing. Okay, so we're going to start with smell or olfaction. Um, olfactory organs provide sense of smell and they're located in the nasal cavity on either side of the nasal septum. Remember the nasal septum is, going back to your bone knowledge, it's made up of the perpendicular plate of ethmoid and the plate of bomer, um, dividing the nasal cavity into left and right sides. And that's where the olfactory organs are. Um, and the olfactory organs are made up of two layers, olfactory epithelium and then what's called a lamina propria. Okay, so let's take a look at this picture here. We've got, um, we can see the, the front of the skull and then the nose. There's a nostril or external nair. Okay, and then here's the roof of the mouth, the hard palate and the soft palate. So this area here is all nasal cavity. And looking at your, going back to your skull, um, three, these three little bumps here um, are what are called the superior, middle, and inferior meatuses, which um, in your skull lab were what we looked at, the middle and inferior concha. Um, and when they're covered with tissue, we call them meatuses. So when we breathe in, the air kind of gets swirled around these meatuses or concha, and when the air is swirled around, the scent particles or odor particles um, float up here to the olfactory epithelia, where the olfactory organs um, can pick up on the odor and interpret that to um, the brain. Okay. So if we look in a little bit closer at the olfactory organs, um, here are a couple things to point out. Down here we have olfactory cilia. So these are little cilia that grab onto or um, take in the odor particles that we're smelling. And this causes um, this interpretation of that uh, travels through the olfactory cells up towards the olfactory bulb that leads to, um, eventually leads to the brain. So getting into that a little bit more, um, the olfactory glands create a secretion that coat the surfaces of the olfactory organs and the olfactory glands are also, or excuse me, olfactory organs are coated with olfactory receptors. These are very um, connected to very highly modified neurons and the olfactory reception involves detecting dissolved chemicals as they interact with odorant binding proteins. So as we saw here, once we breathe in the odors attach to the cilia, there's binding of receptors, and then there's chain reaction, depolarization, and that message is carried up towards the brain where we send it for interpretation and if it's something we've smelled before then there's memory of it. Olfactory discrimination means that we're able to distinguish between thousands of chemical stimuli um, and we can interpret smells by the pattern of receptor activity so we can remember things that we've smelled before and can interpret good from bad and something that smells like something else that we've smelled before. Um, so all those memories help us to kind of sort that out. There is considerable turnover in the olfactory receptor population, meaning that the receptors um, are not, uh, they don't work forever and they're constantly being replaced and repaired. 
and the number of olfactory receptors declines with age. So um, older people tend to not be able to smell as well as younger people are able to smell. Taste, which is also known as gustation, um, gives us information about the food and the liquids that we take in. We have taste receptors um, that are on the tongue and parts of our pharynx and larynx. Pharynx being the back of your throat and larynx is of course what leads down into the respiratory system. Now these taste receptors are clustered into what we call commonly taste buds. Taste buds um, are associated with epithelial projections, um, and they're more, the more fancy term is lingual, which means tongue, papilla, um, which means nipple-shaped, on the superior or top surface of the tongue. This is where our taste buds are, of course. Um, and if we look at the tongue here, we can see that the tongue is going to be coated with taste buds. There are three major types of taste buds represented here. Um, this is the circumvallate papilla uh, taste bud. Here's the fungiform papilla taste bud. And here's the filiform papilla taste bud. Um, and they're each covered with taste hairs or microvilli and taste pores. So we're able, um, the, the flavors kind of move over the taste hairs and the taste pores and we're able, able to interpret that um, using, of course, our brain. So on the tongue, we can see the regions of taste. We have sour, bitter, salty, and sweet. And then one um, back here in the back called umami. Okay, and we'll talk about that here in just a second. So taste buds contain basal stem cells and what are called gustatory cells. And that's what I was just showing you that have the taste hairs um, so here, going the wrong way, sorry. Here was the gustatory cell with the taste hairs and the taste pore. Okay. Um, again, I'm going the wrong way. I'm so sorry. I'll get it eventually. Okay. So taste hairs and taste pores are what's part of the gustatory cells and they survive only 10 days before they're replaced. So there is definitely a quick turnover in the gustatory cell world. So our primary tastes are sweet, salty, sour, and bitter. And then we have some additional taste sensations, umami, which is um, what we are typically tasting when we taste beef or chicken broth and Parmesan cheese. Pretty good stuff. Um, receptors that are, these are umami receptors are sensitive to amino acids, peptides, and nucleotides. Well, that makes sense because remember amino acids are the building blocks of protein. Um, and of course, beef and chicken broth would have not much, but a little bit of protein. Um, and Parmesan cheese, of course, there's some protein in that as well. Water um, receptors, uh, there are water receptors in the pharynx that detect water. So moving into the eye, um, we have some accessory structures of the eye um, that provide protection, lubrication, and support. So we'll start first with the palpebrae which is fancy for eyelids, um, the super, superficial epithelia of the eye, and then we'll look at the lacrimal apparatus. So let's take a look at what those things are. Skip to a picture here. Um, all right, so the palpebrae, of course, would be the eyelids. Um, and then we can see the surface epithelia, or the surface of the eye, this white area is called the sclera. And we'll go into a few other of these terms here in just a minute. Now let's go back to our text. Oh, and I forgot to mention, the lacrimal apparatus, that's fancy for tear duct. 
So the eyelids or palpebrae are a continuation of the skin and obviously we blink a lot during the day and the blinking keeps the surface of our eye lubricated or moist, free of dust and debris. The palpebral fissure is the gap that separates the upper and lower eyelid and we do have a picture that's going to demonstrate that here in just a second. Um, <clears throat> We also have what's called the medial canthus and lateral canthus. This is where the two eyelids connect. The eyelashes are hair, very coarse terminal hair that prevents foreign objects or matter from reaching the surface of the eye. Tarsal glands secrete an oily or lipid rich product that helps keep the eyelids from sticking together. So, um, we're going to take a look at all of these terms, just kind of getting the terms down, and we're going to take a look at them in the next picture. The superficial epithelia of the eye. Um, we have the lacrimal caruncle. Do you sometimes wonder who makes these words up? Um, which is a mass of soft tissue that contains gland that produces thick secretion. So what we call um, the gunk in the corners of our eyes when we wake up, that's created by the lacrimal caruncle. So that's why it says it contributes to the gritty deposits that appear after a good night's sleep. And conjunctiva is the epithelia that cover the inner surface of your eyelids. Okay, so let's look at some of these main things here. So obviously we know what eyelashes are. Um, the center of the eye, of course, the black area would be the pupil, which can dilate or constrict based on how much light we want to let in. Palpebrae are the eyelids. The palpebral fissure is the space between the upper and lower eyelid. Sclera is the white of the eye. And the colored area would be called the iris. The corner of the eye we call the medial canthus, and the edge of the eye here we call the lateral canthus. And then this little fleshy part here is the lacrimal caruncle, and that's what forms the gritty deposits after a good night's sleep. So the lacrimal apparatus is the tear duct, which will produce, distribute, and remove the tears. Lacrimal glands are pretty sophisticated because they actually, not only do they secrete the tears, but the tears contain an enzyme called lysozyme, which is actually antibacterial. So if you get something gross in your eye, a bacteria of some sort, the lysozyme does a great job at trying to fight infection. Um, and so it keeps us from getting infections as often as we would if we did not have lysozyme in our tears. Speaking of that, um, this inner lining right here of the eye, right in here, that is the conjunctiva, the inner lining of the eyelids. And so when we say conjunctivitis or inflammation of that, that's pink eye, which is really disgusting if you've ever had it, um, and especially the bacterial kind because there's a whole bunch of um, pus and matter formed inside the eye and it's terribly painful and awfully gross. But that's what conjunctivitis means, um, is inflammation of that conjunctiva. Okay? Alright, so the eyeball itself is hollow and is divided into two main cavities, the large posterior cavity and the small anterior cavity. So looking at this simple view here, um, up at the front we have the, of course, the anterior cavity. And that would be right here, anterior cavity, and then we've got posterior cavity. So let's start with the anterior cavity. Um, the fibrous tunic contains the cornea, which is, if you were to touch your eye right now to put in a contact, the cornea is this outside surface that kind of bumps up a little bit. It's where the colored part of the eye shows. Um, the iris, or the color, is actually under the cornea. 
Um, but this area looks colored. So whether your eyes are brown, green, or blue, that's going to reflect right here. Um, and starting at the edge of the cornea where the color is, we have the sclera. Okay, so that's the white part, the sclera. On the other side, we have what's called the vascular tunic or uvea, and that includes the iris, the ciliary body, which is what's going to help control the lens. That's the lens right here, this white thing. And then the choroid, this lining of the eye. Here is the posterior cavity, much larger. And this here is the optic nerve that goes to the brain. The posterior cavity, um, down here at the bottom, we have the retina, okay, which is made up of the neural and pigmented part of the lining of the eye. And we'll talk a little bit about what we find back here in just a minute. Okay, so this is a different view um, of essentially the same thing. So we've got there the palpebrae, which is the eyelid and the eyelash. We've got the inside lining of the eyelid, which would be the conjunctiva. We've got the cornea here, the iris underneath where the pupil is, and then the lens. Okay. Back here, we have the optic nerve and the retina. The sclera is the white of the eye. And we just looked at the cornea. We'll go back. Okay. So the sclera is here, the white of the eye, and then where it begins to meet the colored portion, that's called the cornea. and the limbus, which is the border between the cornea and the sclera. So where the cornea and the sclera meet, we call that the limbus. The eye also contains papillary constrictor muscles that change the diameter of the pupil based on light. So if there's way too much light, um, the pupil will actually contract um, so that, or the pupil constricts so that too much light doesn't go in because that can be really painful. So right here, here's the norm, kind of in the middle. And if there's way too much light, then the constrictor muscle will contract and the pupil will look much smaller as we can see here and in this picture above. If there's not much light, then the pupil dilates or opens up so that we can bring more light in. And that's what this example would be here. So the pupil is much, much larger to let more light in. The retina has an outer layer called the pigmented part and an inner layer called the neural part. And it contains visual receptors and neurons um, the rods and cones are the thing we talk about the most typically. These are photoreceptors. Rods do not discriminate light colors, but are highly sensitive to light. Cones provide color vision, and they're densely clustered in what's called the fovea. Okay, so we look here and we can see the fovea. Okay, so up here at the top is, of course, where the visual is coming in through the pupil and the lens, and then here we are in the posterior chamber of the eye, all the way back to here where the fovea is. And in this area where the fovea is, where we're going to find lots and lots of rods and cones interpreting color and light. Okay, so here's what rods and cones look like up close. Uh, this is a cone, and right beside it we have some rods. So the cone there and some rods there, located in the fovea. The small anterior cavity up at the front it contains what's called aqueous humor, which is a fluid that circulates around inside the eye. Okay, so here we are at the front again. There's the pupil and the iris and the cornea. OK, 
Okay, and this here is the anterior chamber, which is filled with aqueous humor. Okay, and back here is the posterior chamber, and there's also going to be something filling the inside of it, which is called the vitreous area or vitreous chamber, and it's filled with a gelatinous mass, so very jello-y in there, a jello-y fluid, um, and it helps, this gelatinous mass helps to stabilize the eye shape and also support the retina. The lens is made up of crystalline, which gives us clarity and helps us to focus. Um, so whenever we refer to someone having a cataract, um, this is when the lens has lost its transparency, so it's not as nice and clear as it used to be, so there's sort of a clouded look in the eye, which is common with age. Okay, so the lens um, is responsible for refracting light, um, and it bends light, um, and we're, there's two terms we should look at before we focus on that. Um, we have the focal point, which is the point of intersection on the retina, and the focal distance, which is the distance between the center of the lens and the focal point. So let's see what that really looks like because it doesn't sound like much. All right, so here it is in a picture. This blue here represents the lens of the eye, okay? And these lines represent the light from a distant source that you're looking at, okay? So all this light comes in and goes through the lens and the lens bends the light into one focal point, okay? So that's the focal point there and the distance is the distance, the distance measured would be the distance between the lens and the focal point, okay? So the closer the light source, the longer the focal distance. So if we look here, um, we have the, a close source that we're looking at, and that close source of light goes through the lens and the focal point is a little farther away. Okay, so focal point again is the specific point of intersection on the retina, and the focal distance is the distance between the lens and the focal point. So the lens is bending the light and it all, all that bent light will focus into a focal point or intersect at a focal point. Accommodation is um, <clears throat> when the shape of the lens changes to focus an image on the retina and the lens can change shape because of the muscles that uh, pull on it, and we'll take a look at that in just a second. Um, and then we've got an astigmatism where light passes through the cornea and the lens is not refracted properly. Um, this can make the visual image look distorted. Visual acuity is good clarity of vision, and the normal rating is 20-20. So we often hear about having 20-20 vision being a good thing because it's considered perfect vision. We go back to picture of the eye here, okay? So see right here where the lens is? It's attached to these suspensory ligaments. Those ligaments can tighten and stretch with, um, with the needs of the eye. So the lens can flatten out, it can round out, it can change position based on what the needs are at the time to get that focal point. Okay. All right, so here was a picture here. Um, we can see the ciliary muscle is contracted, so the lens rounds out for closer vision. And here the ciliary muscle relaxes the lens is more flattened, and this is how the lens would look for distant vision. So it can change shape based on the needs of, the, of vision at that time. Okay, color vision um, is the integration of info from red, green, and blue cones. 
Um, color blindness is obvious, obviously the inability to detect certain colors. And this is a common color blindness test that's done. Um, so if you can see the, the red 12 in the center of those dots, then you are A-OK. -okay. If you cannot, then you might be partially colorblind. All right, so visual data um, from your field of vision arrives at the visual cortex of the opposite occipital lobe. Now we saw this back in chapter 14 when we looked at the hand holding the pencil. The right hand was holding the pencil, but that field of vision arrived in the left hemisphere of the brain. So the left half of your vision arrives at the right occipital lobe of the brain and the right half of whatever it is you're looking at arrives at the left occipital lobe. Remember the, the um, left side of the brain controls the right side of the body and the right side of the brain controls the left side of the body. Um, and the same thing goes with your vision where the right eye sends information to the left side of the brain and vice versa. All right, so finishing up a little bit about the ear. So the external ear is called the auricle um, and it surrounds the entrance to the external acoustic meatus. So again, going back to your skull anatomy, the opening um, for the ear. It protects the opening of the ear canal and provides directional sensitivity. So it acts kind of like a funnel. It's going to pull in sound waves, funnel them in so that we can hear. Um, the external acoustic meatus ends at the eardrum, which is also known as the tympanic membrane. The tympanic membrane is very thin, partially transparent sheet that separates the external ear from the middle ear. So here's a picture. We have the external acoustic meatus, the external ear here, surrounded by the auricle. Okay, there's the eardrum or tympanic membrane, middle ear, and then this would be the inner ear here. The external ear has in it ceruminous glands, and this is something we talk about back in chapter 5 um, when we talk about different kinds of glands. Ceruminous glands are glands that make earwax, which is also known as cerumen. These are integumentary glands found in the external acoustic meatus, and they secrete a waxy cerumen, which helps to keep foreign objects out of the tympanic membrane and keep bacteria from growing. Bacteria do not like earwax, so this slows down the growth of bacteria in the external acoustic meatus or ear canal. The middle ear is also called the tympanic cavity and it, will, it communicates with the nasopharynx via the auditory tube. Um, and this will allow for equalization of pressure um, inside the skull and sinuses on either side of the tympanic membrane. The middle ear also is where we'll find the three auditory ossicles or ear bones called the malleus, which is the hammer, the incus, which is the anvil, and the stapes, which is the stirrup. Okay, so let's take a look at that. All right, so here we have the eardrum or tympanic membrane that separates the external ear from the middle ear. And here we have, um, this is the malleus or hammer. This is the incus or anvil. And that is the stapes. That's the middle ear. Okay, so here's a an actual view inside the ear. We can see the eardrum here, and we can see the stapes very easily there, and a little bit of the incus. Vibration of the tympanic membrane. Um, sound will be converted into mechanical movements inside the ear, and the auditory ossicles will conduct those vibrations into the inner ear for interpretation. 
The inner ear contains a fluid called the endolymph. And there is also going to be a bony labyrinth that surrounds and protects a membranous labyrinth. Labyrinth meaning maze. Um, and it's subdivided into three main areas. The vestibule, semicircular canals, and the cochlea. Okay, so we can take a look at that here. All right, so this again is the inner ear. All right, so we've got this area here represents the vestibule. Here are the semicircular canals. You can see these loops going around. Okay, all these loops. And then here we have the cochlea. Looks kind of like a snail shell. Okay, so the vestibule, semicircular canals, so there's the vestibule, semicircular canals, and then we have the snail shell, which is the cochlea. Okay, so hearing the cochlea duct receptors. Uh, will provide a sense of hearing. So remember again that sound vibrations come into the ear and their or sound waves come into the ear and they're converted into mechanical vibrations. And with age, damage can accumulate. Um, and you know, as we have ended just about every chapter in this book, including all the way through future chapters in the Anatomy 2 material, um, we end every chapter with what's going to happen to you when you age. But with age, damage accumulates in the ear, the tympanic membrane becomes less flexible, and the articulation or joints between the ossicles of the ear, remember that's the, um, the hammer, the malleus, incus, and stapes. So the articulation between them will stiffen, which can certainly affect the ability to interpret those mechanical vibrations and bring them in from the outside. And this will conclude the overview of the special senses.